Good evening. This is Stephen Potts. Uh, welcome to this evening's program. You know, one of the biggest challenges we have in our practices, and I do practice 180 days a year, just like a lot of other people out there, or more days, is, is the Class II restoration. There's going to be several of these in a, in a series of uh, talks over the next few weeks. This one's going to be kind of a general overview of some of the challenges and techniques and things we have. And in an average practice today, uh, you know, there's uh, probably up to 45% of the composites placed are in the Class II category, which is an enormous amount of uh, challenges it brings to our practice. Uh, like I said, some people more stress or fear than other people, uh, a little bit of confidence in what they're doing there. But it's uh, a large portion of the direct composite uh, market that we, we have and we have to deal with each day. And there's, there's several studies. That, the good thing is uh, the Journal of Adhesive Dentistry just recently put out a study on the 10-year clinical performance of resin composites. And uh, they had a study, and I don't know how they managed to get them all back, but they had 29 of the 30 patients that they had done uh, composites on 10 years ago. And they came back in for inspection, and success rate was at 96%, which is a pretty good clinical record of what we're doing and where we're going with direct composites. They've gotten better. Adhesion's gotten better. Uh, matrices have gotten better. There's a whole lot of things that make make our job a lot easier. And so uh, and there's a lot of clinical evidence now to, to back it up. You know, so when we look at things, I want to look at five different areas kind of quickly tonight. The first being adhesive dentistry, matrix systems, you know, adaptation of matrix systems, uh, composite materials, you know, there's a lot of different co composite materials out there, curing lights, and then, of course, finishing and polishing are, are kind of the way we'll finish up the evening here looking at these things. And, and they're all got individual things you could spend an, over an hour on each one of these if you wanted to. I think starting with adhesive dentistry, you know, we have to look at what's uh, important to us uh, as far as adhesive dentistry concern. And obviously, most people with First thing would say is uh, hopefully not a lot of sensitivity or lack of sensitivity. There's nothing more frustrating than to have uh, someone come back in your office, a patient that has uh, certain amounts of sensitivity from a, a restoration you've done. And then with the adhesive, you know, is it something that the handling is, is not too runny or not too uh, thick? Uh, you know, bond strengths, whether it's to enamel or dentin, we'll talk a little bit about those uh, in the next few minutes as well. Uh, we'd like to have an adhesive do that. Simplicity. You know, the nice thing is adhesives are getting more simple, less bottles, less things to have to con be concerned with when you're placing a direct or an indirect. And then, you know, obviously long-term predictability and the application technique. You know, some are a little easier than others to place. So we'll kind of look at all these as well. And looking through here, where things are have been, and we've seen all of these from 25 years and past ago from Tolech on down to now where the market is moving more toward universal adhesives. And that gives us the option to whether have phosphoric acid in what we're doing, uh, whether it's a direct or indirect, or going with a totally self-etch, or maybe even a selective etch mode. So we'll look at some of those as well here. Now what's interesting is that 20 to 20, 20 to 30 percent of the the uh, dentist I see out there uh, uh, when I'm you know, lecturing around the country is about that 20-30% still do a total edge technique. So I wanted to just quickly cover a couple of things dealing with that that may uh, make a difference with you. I mean, obviously isolation is, is an issue, which we will go into a couple of studies on that real quickly. And then for a total edge, now we're not talking anything about self-edge right now, for a total edge technique, uh, chlorhexidine is something that I use a uh, 2% or less to clean any kind of preparation, whether it's a direct or indirect. I do rinse that off afterwards just to have a clean surface to bond to uh, no matter what procedure I'm doing. The key or the t total etch more than anything else is two things. One is the amount of time the etching is left on the dentin, which is, should be no longer than 10 to 15 seconds. And then, of course, over drying the dentin when you rinse this off is really critical as well. And then there's a, another area that people talk about some, and that is, well, after I etch, do I go back and, and re-wet the tooth with some kind of, uh, you know, uh, 
Curacil, Gluma, Tulacid, Red. Uh, I, I want to show you a couple of studies in which uh, using 2% or less chlorhexidine for a wetting agent in the total etch technique does significantly increase bond strengths long term. And so let's look at some of these things here. Franklin Tay uh, several years ago came up with a with a uh, I guess a, a theory on things with the enzymes being in the tooth uh, actually break down the dental hybrid layer, and that doesn't happen immediately. It happens over a period of time in long term dental studies of binding strengths. We were able to to, to see that. And so uh, there's been several studies since Franklin Tay came out with this. The Journal of Adhesive Dentistry in 2013 talked about chlorhexidine and you know pretreatment uh, of a, a bonding surface with that. Uh, and I'm not going to, of course, read all these things, but there's been several that talk about, especially down here at the bottom, where uh, regardless of the concentration, there seemed to be a significant influence on the bond strength. Now people ask, with chlorhexidine, I'm usually talking about a one to two percent maximum. You uh, really don't need anything any stronger than that or concentrated more than that. And um, the other question people have when we talk about this is whether they can use um, Paradex or something of that nature and I would prefer not to because of the preservatives and the different things. Another thing that comes up is I keep seeing pop up in a lot of these journals is some people will talk about sodium hypochlorite for a wetting agent and there's been numerous studies that shows that it definitely decreases the bond strength, which also brings up uh, a study I actually read today where if you're doing an endodontic procedure and you finish that endodontic procedure to be sure that the, the sodium hypochlorite is completely cleaned and rinsed out of the tooth before you put a post and core or anything of that nature, or that can affect the bond strength as well. Other quick things along what we just talked about, uh, what about salivary contamination uh, while you're trying to do an adhesive procedure like a class 2 restoration. Um, there's been studies that have shown that uh, actually if you uh, have the adhesive already on the tooth, if it does get some kind of contamination, to you know dry that off, reapply, rinse it off and reapply the adhesive and the bond strength stays pretty close to the original strength. So uh, obviously this is something you don't want to make a habit out of, but if it does, uh, there's been some evidence to prove that, that you can uh, not have to start completely over with the procedure. Ideally, it would be best to either isolate or use a rubber dam so that wouldn't be a concern to begin with. Now let's talk just a minute about self-etching. You know, obviously there's some things that we don't have to, to worry as much about. The smear layer becomes part of the hybrid layer. Uh, it all you know, occurs simultaneously. And then the reaction is self-limiting. You're never going to be able to over-etch in a self-etching reaction or technique. Uh, looking further down the page, you can see here that self-etchants, the uh, pH is not nearly as uh, acidic as obviously the total etch technique as well. So uh, self-etching has a lot of merits. There's some, some techniques about this that make this kind of critical. We'll talk about those as well, uh, looking at this uh, difference between the two techniques. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that when we're talking about where adhesives are trending toward is now more in the universal adhesive market. I've got several on the, the uh, screen here. There's a lot of good products out there that do a nice job with uh, 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 in the uh, more in the universal realm of things. And so those are uh, some of the those and more you're going to be seeing on the market in the next uh, few months as well here to look at. I do use a lot of uh, prime and bond elect in my practice. I decided, uh, I guess, several years ago, it was much easier for me instead of having a self-etch that I use on some procedures and a total etch on other procedures, if I can have one adhesive do everything. And for me, that's, I've done hundreds and hundreds of restorations. It seems to be work ideal. I don't have to worry about uh, which adhesive I'm pulling out of the drawer, neither does my assistant, for that matter of fact. The other thing with this is obviously it can be indicated in a lot of different manners, whether it's direct or indirect, whether you're doing lithium silicate, something like Emax, or you're doing uh, zirconia, or you know monolithic zirconia, uh, even if something you need to add a dual cure activator, you can for post and cores, those type things. Uh, so there's a lot of areas that it can 
approach, depending on which way you do your dentistry, it can all work out uh, with one adhesive, which does make it a lot more simple uh, from the standpoint of uh, not having to worry about which one you select. Uh, I personally like, and no matter which adhesive you use, liking the unidose systems because I know that it's a fresh dose every time I open the bottle or, or the uh, unidose. If a bottle technique, sometimes you have to be careful and make sure that your assistant places the cap back on so the solvents don't evaporate, which can be a real issue if you're in a pretty busy practice and, and someone's not paying attention to, uh, to that. So uh, I like the unidose for that particular reason. Also, the other things about Prime and Bond that Elect that I do like is I don't have to worry about film thickness. I mean, you can, whether you're self-etch or uh, dentin enamel, total etch, I mean, even if you put several coats, you would still be ideally under 10 microns, which is kind of where I like to, to say no restoration is going to fit, especially lab restoration is going to fit that tight anyway. But the, also for any kind of uh, direct restorations, you've got um, something you don't have to worry about too thick of film thickness, which makes it kind of nice also. Now, and the thing that's been always troubling in the past, uh, you know, being in, I guess, dentistry for over 30 years, is the fact that looking at some of these things, how they've evolved, you know, with, with self-etch, um, uh, strength, you know, is something that's always been a real issue on unground enamel. And with Prime and Bond Elect now, you can see that, that with the unground enamel, you stay in above uh, 20 megapascals, which is kind of the bar that you want to stay above with. If you wanted just to totally go into the self-edge mode of what you're trying to do in dentistry, uh, if you wanted to do a, a total edge, obviously you're going to get even higher bond strength, especially on the enamel. It gives you an option, and we're going to be talking a little bit about class twos. A lot of times my preference is to, if I can, do what I call a selective etch, and that's just, you know, etch the enamel around the exterior margin down in the box. You don't have to worry too much about the dentin and rinse that off and kind of get the best of both worlds. But again, that's a choice that you can make on every clinical situation that you have in your office. The other thing, real quickly, is moisture tolerance, whether it's obviously dry, you know, there's always concern whether the dentin is too dry or too moist. You've got a range of tolerance here that makes this kind of nice, again, kind of keeping you from having to second guess yourself at what you're trying to, to do here or your assistance either over drying or, or not having the uh, preparation, you know, too moist either. So it kind of gives you a, a lot of options. So whether you're doing direct composite dentistry, something like you're seeing here, you have a choice of whether you want to just totally self-etch on the left side of the screen the middle, selectively etch, or over here, go into a total etch mode, which, again, every indication may be a little bit different depending on what kind of bond strength, how deep you are into the tooth, if you're worried about that. Uh, if you're doing a class five, maybe another story where you may not want to use any etching because you're worried about the uh, cementum and the gingival area. Even in laboratory restorations, you have choices, which makes it kind of nice from either no etch, total etch, to selective etch. And uh, so a lot of times now with a lot of these uh, three-quarter crowns and things, I will generally look at selectively etch and just stay around the enamel here and not do a whole lot with the dentin. But again, that's kind of a choice that I do like about Prime and Bond Elect to give you the options to do what you feel you need to do in that particular clinical situation. Now, when we're looking at some of the things here, these are some of the challenges that I see, I guess, when I'm looking at a class two restoration. You know, obviously getting between the teeth, that's kind of a tough area. Getting the matrix band, getting the wedge placed correctly. Do you have a tight contact or not enough, not tight contact? Can you get it light cured? I mean, there's a lot of things to look at here, and we'll kind of address these in the next few minutes here of the program. I think one of the things that's changed about adhesive dentistry is not having to be quite as aggressive as we used to be. I know when I graduated from dental school, we did a lot of extension for prevention and dovetail type of preparation. So when you have a small edge between the teeth like you see in this here, uh, a lot of times we would have a tendency to want to make the preparation all the way to the mesial part of this tooth where now I think you can feel pretty comfortably to do a little slot prep if you have a small etch. Obviously, I would have that kind of converged, and I would selectively etch this, to be uh, 
and my preference, or I, again, your choice of what you wanted to do here. But I think it can, the more two structure you can save, uh, you got your contact areas that you don't have to be involved. If you had the central groove, you may have to worry about. So I think less chance for failure when you look at things like that as well. So I, I don't think you have to be nearly as aggressive as we used to have to look at some of these things here. Um, and again, looking through some of these things here, and uh, this is courtesy of Dr. Matlata, uh, is you know you just go in and you can prep what you need to prep. And when you got some pretty heavy contact areas over here, over here in these areas like this here, or where areas that you don't have to extend your preparation into, it makes for a lot easier for finishing because again you're not having to worry about occlusion as much. Um, you you can have the, the main contacts there. And again, you know, you have smaller areas like this, and you have them kind of uh, in, a, in an undercut mode just a little bit with with a uh, selectively etch here. You can get some nice, efficient restorations that uh, are quick and easy to finish out, and not have to worry so much about the uh, uh, the whole occlusal surface being destroyed and the contact of, as well as the occlusion of what you're looking at here. So I've got just several examples of different ones. You know, as you're prepping out here. Again, a few more little things and decay still needs to be removed in some of these, but, but any of these type of preparations, I would probably go in and selectively edge some of these areas here, whether it's here or over here. If you have trouble and you're worried about a contact here, you can either, if you want, want to put a matrices in here, and we'll talk about in a second, you can either put your, uh, your clamp on to expand this out here or take a, a little instrument and, and just put between here enough to slide your matrices in here. So we'll talk about a lot of these things, but I think these preps can be very beneficial and, and help the patient long term versus uh, going into the entire occlusal surface. And just a couple more illustrations. Even on occlusals, I think this is a good idea to, to maintain as much of the tooth structure as you can so that you can be a little bit more conservative. I think aesthetically it works out better also from the standpoint of not having to worry as much because you can take some of the things we'll talk about here and get a real chameleon effect to get a nice blend of uh, colors in these smaller preparations like this. Now people ask sometimes would you ever use a flowable in a case where you have uh, something this small? There's some things you could look at. I, I'd really be careful even, I mean some of the best flowables out there and there's some great ones that if you get a lot bigger than this, the, the wear rate may not be as good as it would with a traditional composite. And again, we're going to talk about those in just a few minutes here. But something small you could, uh, and uh, looking at this, uh, one of the other factors we'll be talking about in a few minutes is uh, shrinkage and on the uh, C factor on these small type of uh, surfaces. So we'll look at that as well. But you could use something like a flowable on something small like this. Here's a class three, or class two, excuse me, that's three years old. And I look at this, and, you, and people say, well, what, what went wrong? What did I do wrong? Uh, and, you know, and there's no way in retrospect unless you were there when it was done. But the first thing I would look at is the failure. Is it set up due to an adhesive issue? You know, go back and look. What kind of adhesive process did I, did I if I'm, even if I'm using self-etch, you know, you need to let the self-etchant uh, integrate with the tooth. You need to kind of make sure that you're lightly uh, agitating with a micro brush to self etching if you're going to use that. So make sure your adhesive process is sound. You know, um, was there too much of a bulk composite? Is it shrinking too much? Uh, did you put too much in at one time and you got a little bit of shrinkage of the margins? Or is it your curing light? Or how? Or did you go at an angle? Maybe you didn't get the box. Or in this case, it was like the occlusal surface completely cured. So that would be another thing that I would question or look at. And of course, did you get any contamination in the process of uh, trying to fill this? So there are several things to, to question yourself on when you're looking at things or you see things like this because we're all going to make these mistakes and have to go back and try to figure out what we did or what we could have done differently in the future. The other part now we have to look at, which is also uh, a preference on things that you look at is what kind of matrix system. There's uh, just a few I have on the screen here. There's so many other ones out there that you could utilize and use. I know when I was uh, in school, we had used more of a top of my retainer. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sectional matrix out there that work very nicely as well. 
So we'll, we'll kind of look at these and, and look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of these things. I think the biggest thing about your matrix, matrix system is if you don't get this placed and get it sealed right, you can have some catastrophic failure pretty quickly. Uh, when you look at things and, you know, this doesn't take long from maybe appearing good on the occlusal surface to this decay getting to the nerve within a quick visit or so of hygiene and, and you may not even notice it until it's almost too late. So I think getting a good ad adaptation of the matrix system is, is vital to a class two success. Now, again, nothing wrong with any of these procedures. I'm just giving, I guess, my slant or my side to it. And, and wedges, wooden wedges work fine with like what I kind of went through school with and used for years when I got out of dental school. I think there are better systems out there now. The biggest thing, as you can see from this picture, is you can, we used to kind of a kid in dental school, we'd have to wedge this through here until the patient's eyes cross. So we're looking at an area that if you're not careful, you can get a great contact here, but you're going to leave a, an open area below the contact, which food can come in from buccal or lingual if you're not careful. So if you are using wedges, please be careful or not use one, especially if it's too large when you're looking at these type of areas here. And here just looking, you can kind of see comparing a top of my system on the uh, maxillary versus a, uh, uh, a matrix system on the lower, and you can kind of see the contact area. Uh, you know, you got a good contact on the top. The marginal ridge is a little bit more thin. Again, subject to possible food trap. Uh, obviously, these areas here can have a tendency to want to fracture because it's not as thick as what's down here. And again, if you put a wedge that's too large in here, you can get the contact, but you'll leave too much open here. I think it would be more ideal to have a contact that's, that's more of a surface area versus a point. And so those are things that, that can be very uh, helpful when you're considering your matrix systems to look at. And then, and then here's just a good example of over wedging. You know, you've got, you take your floss, it'll pop through there, but look at the, the space that you've got and, the, and how subject this is to future decay. Even if you don't get food from this surface, you'll get it from the buccal or lingual surface. And, and that, this is strictly from over wedging is what this is from and not getting this matrices where it needs to be adapted here. So a lot of things can happen. We, we see this in our practice and there's times that if you're not careful, you can easily do it yourself in your own practice. Uh, I, for the last, I guess, quite a few years, have preferred a sectional matrix system just simply from the standpoint it's so much easier to get a nice, con con I guess, consistent contact area, not point. And, uh, and so these have improved uh, over the years. I do like uh, the Paladin Plus system. And one of the reasons is when I get my matrices placed in here, I can put my wedge through here to have adaptation down here. And then the clamp is going to saddle over the wedge, which is going to adapt on the buccal and lingual contours here. So there's less finishing. And, and every single time that the contact is, is, is snug, matter of fact, snug enough, you almost have to have hemostats to get the, the matrices out of here. So it's something that's, um, that can be really predictable from the standpoint of uh, doing a class two. And, and, and that's what makes it a lot less, I guess, stress-free for me in doing this. And, and the Pound and Plus system, it comes with obviously the rings, the matrices, wedges, and something that is kind of interesting. I didn't never pay a lot of it, really a lot of attention to until, uh, you know, if you're ever taken doing a class two next to a gold crown, it, it becomes more apparent that you really need to be careful doing that class two. And these wedge guards kind of set that up pretty nicely because you can place one of those in there before you ever prep anything. And then you're not as concerned about hitting the adjacent tooth this will go ahead and start slight separation of the teeth so you'll get your matrices in here better. So uh, it makes good practice to do that to make your procedure a little bit quicker because with confidence, I don't have to worry about scratching the tooth next to it or nicking whether it's gold or uh, enamel that I'm looking at. And so just looking again from a side view of these, I, I like the way this straddles the uh, wedge and uh, it gives good adaptation to the buccal and lingual surfaces with a premolar and molar uh, ring there it makes it kind of nice uh, to get the uh, adaptation that you're looking for. And there are a lot of different systems out there. You've got, um, you know, uh, older 
matrices systems, the old, older Raven Paladin system, you've got a Garrison system, you've got the, the uh, Paladin Plus in the middle here. And again, uh, long term, I like this system. Uh, there's, they all can work well, but my, my concern sometimes is with some of these, these systems, if you're not careful, the adaptation in approximately can distort a little bit or encroach on the, 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 the proximal area or line angles. And if you're not careful with that, you can get almost too much interproximally here to get an unusual looking restoration. With the Paladin Plus, you can just, this area is a little bit more finished out and not quite so tightly formed there to where you get a, a more of a pushing into a, a smaller area there for your, your composite to fit. Uh, one of the things I get asked a lot with sectional matrix systems is, is the biggest challenge that you may have is trying to get the uh, matrices in there. A couple of suggestions. One would be is before you prep or as you get ready to prep, you can actually just put your matrices, uh, not your matrices, but your ring on here and just have it set there for a couple of minutes while the patient's give, give anesthesia or the patient's giving numb. This will naturally separate enough for you to drop your matrices in there. Or if you don't want to do that, you can actually take, I use a half Holland back to place my composite. I can actually take uh, my half Holland back and place in here and lightly rotate and rock that just enough for a matrices to slide down in there. So either way, you can get enough room to get the matrices in there. If you use a uh, wedge guard, uh, like I mentioned a minute ago, that's another good way to do that, which can make that kind of uh, so something you don't have to worry about trying to, to get the, uh, the matrices in there. Because if not, you have a very tight area, it can distort or bend. So you, you want to think about one of those ways as or before you start prepping. Uh, this just shows uh, another thing that you can't do with the wooden wedges that you can do with this Paladin Plus system is if you have a tooth that is uh, leaning or maybe you need a little bit more of a wedge capacity to, to get that matrices to get a good adaptation of the contact area, you can, like you see in these pictures, I don't do this very often, but you can stack these things here. To, if you've got a tooth that's kind of tilted or leaning like this to get the contact there, you got to be careful. Again, you don't want to create too big an area down through here. So, so it would have to be quite a bit of lean or quite a bit of space to, to try to do that. But you can adapt these because these are very flexible, uh, whereas the wood is not is nearly forgiving on these type of situations. So just looking, again, at a wedge guard, you can see what I like doing is giving anesthesia. And as the anesthesia starts to take effect, place the wedge guard. Actually, you could even prep this, leave this in here, lift this out with this little loop here, put your matrices, and then put your ring over the top of this if you wanted to. So there's a lot of simple ways you can, can do this. Uh, and you can see, every time I do a class two, I end up touching this a little bit, which is good because I would probably end up touching the other tooth if I'm not careful. So it gives you a little more confidence to be a little bit more uh, speed with what you're trying to prep there. So when you're doing these, you can just pop that out, put your matrices in to get a nice quick restoration here uh, as you're going through this. So something to consider. And again, looking here, especially gold crowns and things, you can do these preps kind of quickly. And it just gives me a little bit more confidence to know that I can do that and not have to worry about hitting any uh, tooth. I mean, you can be too aggressive. They're not invincible to go through here in Pinnable. You can get through that, but you'd have to try kind of hard to do so. So looking at matrices, kind of closing this part of it up, we would look at, at the, uh, the benefits, I think, is you could avoid the food traps. And obviously, the most stressful part of, uh, to me, a class two is, is asking the assistant for dental floss, isn't it? When you look at that and you try to, uh, that few seconds I'm getting dental floss, that's the first thing I'm thinking is, do I have an appropriate contact? And you can do multiple restorations if you need to. There's different sizes for these things. If you have a longer one, you can place this down a little bit further. If you have a large mower that you're looking at or if you have a small, uh, maybe pre-mower, you can look at something like this here as well. Uh, and then again, when you've got large spaces and you can do, wanted to do something larger, you can do multiple uh, surfaces 
whether it's an MOD, again, this is kind of pushing the boundaries of where I would go with this. Uh, you can do this. You can selectively etch this if you want to. Uh, you can put a double ring, one on each side, and then you'll get good adaptation here and here around the buckle and lingual so your finishing will be quicker and easier. Uh, again, that's for me is about the extreme to what I'll do. I know some people will go a little bit larger, but uh, whatever you feel in your comfort zone. But you can do multiple surfaces. It's about as quick to me as if I had a, a top of iron trying to get the wooden wedges and getting everything adapted. So I can go pretty quickly like this, just kind of giving you an illustration. Now the next section we talked about besides adhesive and the matrices is uh, composite. Real quickly, there's a lot of bulk fill out there. Uh, again, the market is going that way because now we can do more composite. We're not having to worry about the, the shrinkage stress being so so much that you uh, used to it be two millimeter layers. So now we can kind of move a little quicker. And you know, years ago, this would be the way I would do a, a class two. I'd put a flowable and I'd put several packable layers in here. And this just took an enormous amount of time to do these. You know, whether they're deeper or lesser here, uh, you'd have to put multiple layers. Now, with Surefill, it's something that's been out for quite a few years here. As a matter of fact, just recently, the Journal of Adhesive Dentistry did a three-year study and talked about only a 1% failure rate of, of SDR and, and the flow and, and, and using, utilizing especially these class twos. A study that just came out this August, this past year, talking about uh, class two restorations and they talked about uh, SDR presented significantly higher tensile bond values and incremental filling of these and it basically improved the bond strength and I think that was mainly because of adaptation because it's self-leveling and it can, it can flow and, and level itself and you don't have to try to manipulate it so much that you get a uh, according to this study as well, even a higher bond strength from the SDR. Um, and again, looking at these things, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me, I think, are, are the bulk fill and the self-leveling. Uh, even on an upper mower, you can place the first three to four millimeters or whatever you want to place here of this, and within a few seconds, it'll self-level. It does so it's, it's even uh, when you're on an upper, that's not an issue. And you can go up to four millimeters. So usually in a class two, after I get my matrices and all that adapted, I'll put my first four millimeters out of this and then may put a, a, a capping layer on the top of that. So, um, but, you know, the things that are there, the fluoride, the, uh, uh, so it's the radio opaqueness of, of, of SDR is there for you. And there's nothing more frustrating when you're seeing uh, situations where you've got a, a, not sure if it's radio lucent, radio opaque, what's going on versus the radio opacity you have here. So it gives you a little bit more confidence uh, with SDR. So when looking at some of these, and of course this is not even a class two, but the size of this, I would have to put multiple layers just to get this filled in. And I can, of course I do a lot of toe letch. I will go through here, put my adhesive in here, prime and bind elect, put my SDR. I put four millimeters of that in, and then I would put a capping layer, something like a TPH spectra over the top of that. And that would be the last layer we'd have to look at. We've got the matrices, the adhesion, we've got the, the bulk fill part of this. I always like to have a, a very thin couple of millimeters at max uh, capping layer to, to, to assure the long-lasting wear and aesthetics of the, the restorations. Uh, I do use a lot of TPH spectra depending on which one you want to utilize. They have two types of handling, a low viscosity and a high. Uh, the thing I really like about uh, the TPH Spectra also is uh, the shading system. It's very simplified. Uh, you know, gosh, you can do so much with, with so few of composite shades here. So you've got a low viscosity kind of filtered in between what Filtech Supreme Ultra is, and you've got a higher viscosity. So depending on what you want, everybody likes something a little bit different. Different for class twos, I look at more of a higher viscosity because it's a little bit more sculptable, uh, a little bit uh, stiffer to work with. Now the other thing that makes this nice for me at least is I, I can even be a shade or two off and this is going to match. And uh, what makes this kind of nice is, uh, uh, again, you don't have to be rummaging through a box of 20 or 30 shades to get most of these 
uh, composites to blend pretty nicely here. And uh, again, they come with some basic shades. You can always order more if you think you need them, but for about 95% of the ones I use with Spectra will fall into that. And most of that's taken from something that's basically called metamerism. And just looking here, you can see different shade tabs of an A2 and C1. Don't have time for this particular uh, talk to go into a lot of detail, but you can see when it's photographed under different light sources how different it can look. So the best way to illustrate this in this short time is you take a shade guide and each one of these there was a hole drill through every one of these here and all of them down here. And they placed A35 on this feed of shade guide. They placed A or C2, excuse me, on this shade guide here. And you can see such a variance in shade, but how much or how close that all blends, which makes most any composite you do, if you pick an A1 or, or a B1 or an A2 over a C2, you're going to be pretty close. And uh, just to give you a quick example of one I did here was a class two, and I'm going through the steps kind of quickly. The actual shade of the tooth was a B1, and so I wanted to be a shade or two off on purpose, so I did my selectively etch here, I placed my adhesive, I placed my composite, and this was an A1. And again, not a big difference between an A1 and a B1, but you can still see a1 blended so nicely, and so that's what I kind of like about this. This makes me, my decisions in a day-to-day -day practice quick and easy, going from uh, not having to worry about, I can bulk fill something, I can pick a shade that's pretty close and know that it's going to blend in almost every situation. Now, the other thing we want to look at here real quickly in the last few minutes of this is light curing. Uh, very important. I mean, if you need to have all these pieces in place for continual success, if one of the pieces of the puzzle we've talked about is not, then you'll ultimately have some kind of failure. The biggest thing I see, and you can look here, from the distance from here to here could be, you know, 10, 12 millimeters or a half inch or whatever, that length. And if an assistant does this or you are curing that far away, you're losing a lot of the intensity and the strength of the light. I would always have this light be as close to this as you can. You know, I would almost actually have this touching the matrices and not be that far away from it because you'll lose so much strength in this picture here. You can see the wattage, how it's diluted out over a period of uh, six or seven millimeters. So that makes a huge difference when you're from here to here. So something to consider. And again, I think uh, when you're looking at this, uh, the things that I would consider uh, you know, a lot of us, and, and these work great in these particular situations, but when you're looking at especially posterior, I like having something that's more of a 90 degree angle here that can, can take care of this pretty quickly. Uh, and, and again, re can reach, in the, especially in the posterior, a little bit better than from an angle like this. And this can be really illustrated, the importance of how uh, light curing can be. And, and definitely think about this when you're doing your next class too. If you're, you or your assistant is curing with a, especially a curved tip or whichever tip you're using here, and you're going from this angle here, it's very likely that if you're not careful that you're going to end up versus something that comes in a 90 degree angle, you're going to end up with an uncured area here that can be, uh, you may have done everything else right here, and then this area is undercured, which will set up for this to be in, in failure mode pretty quickly. So I think this is an important factor. Keep the light close. If you don't have one, at least try to get it at a 90 degree angle to make sure the box is completely cured uh, to have there. Or if not, you can set up for future failure here with micro leakage, recurrent decay, sensitivity, all kinds of things that can happen that will end up in a failure. It could end up with a lot worse than just having a replacement with endodontic procedures or, or even loss of the tooth. So something like the smart light I use daily as well because it's culminated and it's in a straight beam, a 90 degree angle versus something that has to curve uh, to consider. And along with that, the last thing we're going to look at here real quickly and th considering all these factors is, is uh, looking at the C factor in a tooth because Every tooth, you've got to look at the surface that you're going to try to, to bind or have adhesion to. You've got an occlusal surface, you've got a buccal surface, you've got a pulpal surface, 
you've got a lingual surface, you've got a mesial and distal surface. So you could have quite a few, up to five surfaces you're bonding to in most cases. Now, again, everything could be done correctly, and if you do this too, too quickly with too much composite, you can set yourself up for some sensitivity. So when you look at the C factor here, if you go over here, the one that has the most sensitivity is usually the one you consider the most simple. A, a occlusal, uh, a little simple occlusal like this over here, and you're thinking, wow, why did that, what happened to that? First thing I look at is, and most of the times I have something happen, it's because I got too big a hurry and I tried to, to put too much composite too quickly on a class one. You rarely see this on a class four or a class three restoration. It's usually on the class one you see those on. So those, those are the ones you look at. So in kind of summary of what we're talking about here, you know, we talked about the adhesions, the matrix systems, bulk fill, you know, uh, what we can do with SDR, light curing, you know, and then we're going to look a little bit in the last few seconds here on polishing real quickly here. I'd like to go through one that I've done here. You can see tooth 29 had some distal decay here against the gold crown, which obviously speaks volumes to use a wedge guard. So I place this in here. I remove the decay. I'm placing my adhesive. I've got adaptation. The palatine system has got very good adaptation on the buccolingual. So, and this has already separated the teeth enough. I know I'm going to have a tight contact here. Place your SDR. You can do this just in the very bottom of the box. I like taking this up even to the contact as long as I'm not more than four millimeters. I'll place in here, this in here, light cure this. I use my TPH spectra on here, place this in here. Uh, I usually will place a little bit more for my reasoning, like maybe the lingual, and then cure that and do the buckle so I can get my layering and our anatomical considerations. I'd much rather do it at this stage than I had with uh, trying to uh, do it with a burr. I think burrs or scratches more than if I can go ahead and get my anatomical considerations like this. Carbides, I think, is the best way to finish a uh, composite over diamonds. They scratch less, so I would definitely consider this is a 7404 fluted carbide. I love the enhanced cups because I, uh, I can get in approximately and not damage the tissue. Always, always, with any kind of polishing cup, use a little bit of water, have your assistant spray a little bit of water, and try not to use too much pressure. Uh, I do like this from this standpoint. This, if you use too much pressure, this will, will not do what it needs to do, and it will let you know pretty quickly. So just lightly go in here with a little bit of water. The, the TPH spectra will, will, will shine up very nicely. Uh, you don't want to get too much heat on the pulp. Uh, so with any type of polishing point, definitely keep that in consideration as you go through this. Um, so this is kind of the, the process in which I went through here this evening. I know this has been very quick. We've gone through a lot of things uh, here. I'm going to now turn this into a few questions here, if there are questions to be uh, asked. And uh, we'll take a moment and, and do this here. It says, uh, one of them here is, what is your feeling about incorporating chlorhexidine or quad am compounds into adhesives to decrease the uh, uh, enzyme activity. That's a question I unfortunately can't answer. I don't, I think that would be a good idea for a company to do. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody incorporating chlorhexidine into an adhesive now that I'm aware of, but I think that would, uh, uh, would be a, a good idea. I think uh, uh, it would save a step there, but I'm not aware of anyone that's doing that right now. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry I can't be a little bit more, uh, I expound on that any more than that is, but that's a great question. Uh, another quick one here, do you prefer a flowable composite over a glass ionomer for the first layer? You can do either thing. I know that's been taught through the years. There's no really wrong about doing a glass ionomer. It takes a little bit longer, and as long as the glass ionomer doesn't go up the, the wall, exit wall, or the pulpal floor too far, uh, you know, and you got plenty of bond strength because remember your composite is not going to bond uh, to a glass of onomer as, as well as it will to dentin. But but there's no reason if you want if you got a deep restoration you want to do a glass of onomer that would be okay to do that. Uh, uh, so, um, but 
there, there's no really right or wrong about that. I don't do that personally because of the time factor, but I know a lot of people that do, and that seems to work out very nicely. Um, let's look at a few more questions. Someone said, do you adjust restorations using a green stone? You can if you need to. I think the biggest thing is adjusting, I'm talking about composite restorations, is stay away from diamonds. Uh, they tend to scratch more. I would use either something like uh, a fluted carbide or a stone would be fine. Either one of those would work very nicely. Um, let me see here. Um, all right. Uh, how do you restore a prep that involves dropping a box and then extending around the buckle or lingual along the gum line? If it's very much around the, the buckle or lingual, you may have to consider either removing the cusp or doing a separate restoration. When you get to a certain point that it gets beyond the buccal or lingual, it's going to be very difficult no matter what matrix system you're using. I would also might want to challenge if that's the case, if it's that larva restoration, looking at it possibly uh, if the cusp need to be removed or if it doesn't need to be removed, is it something that, uh, that you can uh, maybe look at some kind of laboratory restoration. Uh, uh, would be what I would look at uh, because that gets very difficult when you start getting uh, like an MO and then start getting the buccal or lingual surface completely undermined with the K as well. Um, challenging questions, good questions. Any thought on liners? We've kind of covered that. Uh, I don't have a problem with using a glass on or liner on that. Um, it says something here about how would you treat class 5 lesions involving involved me without any preparation. So I think if I understand that question correctly, is a, like an ab fraction lesion, I would assume, uh, without any preparation. Anything like an ab fraction lesion, if you're not going to roughen up the enamel, then I would definitely use a selective edge of that, uh, uh, assume without any preparation to be no decay or any reason to do that. I would then selectively etch that is the way I would prefer to do that. Also, if that's the case, look at why you've got a, an abfraction lesion. It's usually occlusion, so there may be a, an issue with that as, as well uh, to look at. Um, let me see here. Um, uh, it says, my, I selectively etch in ammo and use Optibon XTR, my composite fill tech. Sometimes I notice the margin is a white, chalky appearance. What causes that? Does that affect the bond or seal of the restoration? Generally, there's, there's always this kind of the, the white line effect, and there's been a lot of discussion through the years about that, and there's been discussion whether it's the enamel rod uh, angle shrinkage of composite, uh, too much adhesive, no matter if you can read articles and different debates on that. Generally, if it's uh, uh, something you can fill with your Explorer, I'd probably take it out and replace it. Sometimes a, a small one, if it seems to be pretty fluid, I'm not going to be as concerned about it unless it's in a working area. But uh, those are the three main thoughts on that. There are a lot of different, you could ask different people and get a lot of different theories about that. I see that have more of a tendency on class fives than I do a lot of other restorations, but, but I think the enamel rods can also be something that can be taken in as well as the, the bulk fill of the composite. Um, it says here, when you fail to have a good contact after remove the matrices, what is the best way to repair the box to redo or tighten the contact? Remove the box only, box plus occlusal, flowable buck fill. Uh, you know, if, if the composite is fresh, and I mean by fresh, not something you did two or three weeks ago where they come back with a open contact. Usually you can go back in and open that up and you can remove what you feel is necessary. Uh, usually composites that has just been polymerized, you can bond pretty good to that again. Obviously the ideal way would be to, to clean that up or get a, a good box there again, but but if you have somebody come back a few weeks later and they say there's an open contact, then my suggestion would be to replace the whole uh, restoration uh, more than anything else there. I'm not sure if I understand this. Do you have suggestions to place a matrix on a large, deep, C-shaped margins? Again, I think I'm assuming that means it extends well beyond the buccal lingual surfaces. If the whole 
buccal lingual area where you can get a matrices there, but again, if it stops at the buccal lingual line angles and then becomes just more of a buccal type of restoration, then you may have to look at two type of restorations out of that. Um, somebody did make a comment here, which is a good, I'm always open for comments. Uh, the white line effect is usually a fracture of the enamel, I'm talking about the enamel rods a minute ago. When access is wide and we get into a vertical enamel rods, a wide restorations is beveled. Uh, so there's there's another suggestion there, which is good. Any comments like that? You know, that's the nice thing about dentistry. I've been in it over 33 years. Is there always something to uh, learn? There's a lot of leadway and a lot of uh, things that can work well in one hand. It doesn't work well in the others, and, and that's what makes uh, dentistry nice because you always got different techniques that you can learn from a lot of different people here. So I hope that I've got my email up here on the screen. I'll be more than glad to to continue the conversation or uh, it says, well, one last question here. What is your criteria for select edge versus total edge? Great question. Uh, on on uh, select edge would be something that if like a class two, it would, could be a uh, at least a three quarter and it's say anterior crown or anything that I feel like I need a little bit more bonding strength that you're going to get from etching the enamel margin. If I've got um, four millimeters or more, let's, let's, let's go back to a crown for a minute. If I got a four millimeter height in my crown and it's a 360 degree margin and it's not converged too much, then selective etch, if you're going to do an etch adhesive process, works very nicely. Uh, if, um, if I'm doing a occlusal, I, I'm pretty good with this using uh, selective etch. Uh, total etch, if I'm doing veneers, I especially minimum prep veneers, I still do that quite a bit. Uh, I'll use a, a total edge technique. Again, there's less and less of that out there, but you, I still see 20 to 30 percent of the dentists that, that I see still are using total edge somehow in their practice at this point. Uh, and I think if you don't over etch or over dry, you're, you're still pretty safe in that category. Again, thank you so much for the time uh, we've had this evening.